Today we're checking out what is quite possibly going to be the best GeForce RTX 5090 graphics card you can buy. That is, assuming of course there is stock, which, you know, there isn't, because it's an RTX 5090. But if there was, this is certainly going to be one of the best. So what I'm trying to say is, MSI's Supreme Liquid SoC is very good, but if you don't believe me, that's okay, because I have a 15 minute video review. So now that the clock started, let's get cracking. Firstly, as the name suggests, this is a liquid cooled RTX 5090 using an all-in-one design. So it's not just a graphics card with a water block strapped onto it, it's the full kit and caboodle. Meaning this is a plug and play solution that includes not just the water block, but also a pump and radiator. But let's start with the card, because as you might have expected, it's very different from the air-cooled Supreme version. The most notable difference is of course the size, the liquid model measures just 280mm long, making it 22% shorter than the air-cooled version. It's also a 3 slot design, whereas the air-cooled model requires 4 slots, making it 33% thinner at 51mm. Now in terms of height, they're pretty much the same, but where you'll really notice the difference is in the weight, as the more compact liquid-cooled card weighs 44% less, and that means it won't stress your PCIe slot nearly as much. Now this drastic difference in weight is due to the fact that the heatsink is moved off the card, as the radiator and its fans weigh an additional 1,160 grams, taking the total weight to 2,764 grams. So in the end, just 3% less than the air-cooled version. Now, because this model features an external radiator, there isn't much need for onboard cooling, at least for the GPU and memory. That said, some board components, mostly power delivery components, will require some airflow, and for this MSI has included a single 95mm fan, which vents out the I.O. end of the card, so there's no traditional air pass through here. Still, this single fan design not only allows MSI to create a more compact RTX 5090, but also a much cleaner looking card. So much so that I almost dare say it verges on being a bit boring. But I think really, I'm a big fan of the cleaner design. Front on, the Supreme Liquid looks great, featuring a large brushed aluminium facade and some aggressive angles. And of course, they've even managed to squeeze in a little LED lighting as well, because of course they have. Today's sponsor spot is brought to you by Signal RGB, a free application that controls and syncs RGB devices from over 100 brands of hardware, including Corsair, Razer, and Logitech, just to name a few. The user-friendly software offers access to various presets and lighting options via a clean, easy-to-use interface that even provides the ability to replicate your setup in 2D form on screen. We love the uncapped creative freedom, and this is why we not only recommend it, but also use it ourselves and have done so for years. So if you'd also like to try out Signal RGB for yourself, please click the link in the video description. The side profile of the card also looks very clean, though there is a bit going on here, with a few more LED elements and of course the 12 pin high powered connector, which is recessed into the card making it a little bit tricky to access, though it does provide a very clean look. So I guess form over function on this one. There's also the dual bar switch and by default the card ships with the quiet bars active, though you can switch to the gaming bars and this takes but a matter of seconds. I also really like how MSI has gone with black GeForce RTX branding rather than white, as it blends into the card a lot better and doesn't spoil the clean design. Around on the back plate, there's more GeForce RTX branding, and again, it's in black, so in my opinion, it doesn't spoil the design. There's also the Silver Supreme logo, which looks nice, and the black grille towards the end of the card, though be aware no air passes through this section of the card. The right side of the card, or what is opposite to the I.O. panel, features two sleeve tubes which transfer water to and from the radiator, and this all looks quite neat and tidy. Then around at the I.O. end, you will find a trio of DisplayPort 2.1a outputs and a single HDMI 2.1b output. Then moving over to the 360mm radiator, we find three pre-installed 120mm Storm Force fans, which neatly connect together using custom length wires, and they're not visible. Also, all the wiring does run through the sleeves, so it's very neat and doesn't require any cable management. The radiator itself measures 27mm wide, but with the fans installed, it becomes 55mm wide. And although it is a 360mm model, supporting three 120mm fans, 
the overall length is 394 millimeters, which is a typical length for this type of radiator. So overall, a very neat and tidy design that will make for a quick and easy installation. Now it's time to start pulling this thing apart and the teardown procedure is pretty straightforward. There's 23 screws in total that need to be removed and this will allow you to lift off the back plate and then separate the PCB from the cooler. Then an additional seven screws can be removed if you wanna separate the water block from the heat spreader. The PCB itself measures 220 millimeters long and 145 millimeters tall, the same dimensions as the air-cooled version. And in fact, this is the exact same PCB as what you'll find on the Supreme SOC. So that is the air-cooled model. This means for the power delivery, we have 22 power stages for the GPU with seven for the GDDR7 memory, all using MPS 50 amp power stages. The back plate's also quite familiar, though it is a much shorter version than what we saw on the standard Supreme, given this liquid version is much shorter. That said, we still found some thermal pads on the backside, designed to extract built up heat behind the GPU and power connector. Now, the heatsink on the card, which is more of a hybrid heat spreader slash heatsink, it's very large, weighing 388 grams, and it serves two main purposes. First and foremost, it extracts heat from the power delivery components as they're not cooled via the copper water block, but it also acts as a structural support, protecting the PCB from flexing. Then we have the water block, which connects directly to the radiator via two sleeve tubes. It is possible to service this item, changing or topping up fluids as needed, though this would have to be done under warranty in order to keep your warranty. So while it is technically serviceable, it's not designed to be accessed by the user. The five millimeter thick copper block isn't nickel plated, but it has been machined in a way that reduces the gap between it and the memory chips, reducing the thickness of the thermal pads, which does improve cooling performance. However, there are a series of screws in this section of the block, which sees a portion of most memory chips without direct contact to the block, at least the entire block. There is a small section, a cutout section for the screws where no contact is made at all, whether or not this affects the thermal performance of these memory chips is difficult to say. Overall though, this is an impressive design that appears well built and therefore I expect it should cool the Supreme Liquid SoC graphics card very well. So to find out, let's go stress test it. First up, here's a look at how the Supreme Liquid operates after an hour of playing The Last of Us Part 1 at the 4K resolution using the maximum in-game quality settings. These temperatures were recorded in a 21 degree room installed inside an ATX case with the doors closed. Here we see that the GPU hit a peak of just 55 degrees and that was achieved at a very low fan speed of just 1000 RPM, making the card virtually silent, which is impressive given the over 500 watt load. We also saw the GDDR7 memory peak at just 72 degrees, so as expected the liquid cooled model runs very cool. Then if we switch from the silent BIOS over to the secondary gaming BIOS, the fan speed ramps up to 1200 RPM, and now we're seeing a peak GPU temperature of just 53 degrees and a peak memory temperature of just 70 degrees. Now time for some overclocking. By default, the Supreme Liquid has a boost clock of 2565 megahertz, and it operates the memory at 28 gigabits per second. I was able to overclock the cores to 2815 megahertz and the memory to 30 gigabits per second. Under load, this allowed my Supreme Liquid to reach a stable core frequency of 3030 megahertz, which resulted in an average power draw of 540 watts, while the memory ran at 30 gigabits per second. This saw the GPU operate at a temperature of just 54 degrees and the memory at 72 degrees, with an auto fan speed of 1300 RPM. So very impressive stuff there. Here's a quick look at how Nvidia's Founders Edition, Supreme SoC and Supreme Liquid SoC versions of the RTX 5090 all compare. Stock, the Supreme Liquid is not only the quietest RTX 5090 that we've tested so far, but it also ran an incredible 22 degrees cooler than the air-cooled version. Switching over to the secondary gaming BIOS only reduced the operating temperature by a few degrees, but even so the liquid model was still 14 degrees cooler than the air-cooled version. Then if we noise normalize to 40 decibels, the Supreme Liquid ran 16 degrees cooler than the Supreme SoC, and a massive 24 degrees cooler than the FE model. So if you want to maximize performance while keeping the operating volume to a minimum, the Supreme Liquid looks like the way to go. 
As for the memory temperatures, the Supreme Liquid was much better than the FE model, running 16 degrees cooler when using the stock BIOS. Then switching to the secondary BIOS, this reduced the memory temperatures by a further 2 degrees, which meant the liquid model was also 2 degrees cooler than the air-cooled model. Then when we noise normalized, the MSI card ran 24 degrees cooler than the FE version, so again a huge improvement there. The Supreme Liquid was a mere 2% faster than the FE model in Dying Light 2, but 7% faster once overclocked. In fact, manually overclocked it was also 3% faster than the manually overclocked air-cooled model, as I was able to push the cores a little bit higher. Similar results were also seen in The Last of Us Part 1. Here the Supreme Liquid was 5% faster than the FE model and 10% faster once manually overclocked, rendering a few more frames than the air-cooled version. Testing with Delta Force shows the Supreme Liquid to be 6% faster than the FE model, and I was able to extract a further 4% when overclocked, taking us to 177 FPS. The gains in Marvel Rivals were typical of what we've already seen. Here the Supreme Liquid was just 2% faster than the FE model, but 8% faster once overclocked. Now in terms of power consumption, the Supreme Liquid is very hungry, consuming around 10% more power than the Founders Edition model. That said, it typically consumed around 4% less power than the air-cooled version of the Supreme. I've got no real complaints of MSI's RTX 5090 Supreme Liquid OC. Overall, it is an excellent product, delivering the best thermal performance we've seen yet, and by some margin. And given the roughly 600 watt power usage of the RTX 5090, I think it's fair to say it was always going to be a prime candidate for liquid cooling. And look, as good as the dual slot FE model is, water cooling for a high-end build just makes more sense in my opinion. Of course, you do need somewhere to stick that 360mm radiator, but with basically all modern ATX cases supporting dual RADs, this shouldn't be an issue. The pump is also extremely quiet, so no weird rattles, bubble noises, or anything like that. But of course, our sample is obviously brand new, and a big concern with these AIO liquid cooled graphics cards is longevity. And by that, I don't just mean how long the thing will work before the pump dies, as it will inevitably die at some point, but also how long it lasts before making excessive noise. Though excessive noise isn't a guaranteed problem, but over time stuff like corrosion and gunk can become an issue, leading to louder operation and eventually failure. So that's something just to be aware of in general when picking a liquid cooled graphics card, and again I can't speak to how well the Supreme Liquid will age, at least not yet. The big issue the Supreme Liquid faces right now, and all RTX 5090 graphics cards for that matter, is excessive pricing and horrible availability. Just to recap, the RTX 5090 is meant to cost $2,000 US, and that's the base model MSRP. Of course, the Supreme Liquid SoC isn't a base model, and MSI did first officially list this model for $2,500 US, which is 25% over the MSRP. But since then, MSI has raised the price in their own official store to $2,800 US, so an additional $300 taking the price to 40% above MSRP. And of course, you still can't buy it. Rather, you have to sign up to be notified of stock, and then, if you're lucky, you can part with $2,800 US. But it's not just MSI who's doing this. ASUS has also increased the pricing in their own official store, charging $3,400 US for the Astral LC, an incredible 70% markup over MSRP and 20% more expensive than MSI's own liquid cooled model. Gigabyte also has an AIO liquid cooled model, the Aorus RTX 5090 liquid, and they're asking $2,860. So given all of that, I obviously don't recommend buying an RTX 5090 right now. And I certainly don't recommend purchasing a premium model that's priced in excess of 40% over the MSRP. Pretty crazy stuff, especially given you could have just bought an RTX 4090 a year or so ago for a much more competitively, uh, or much more competitive price. Again, not as performant, but still, you know, doesn't really make sense paying so much for one of these. But I guess, you know, that is the, the craziness around the 5090. But yeah, the Supreme Liquid, it is a really nice product. So I don't want to crap on this product too much. Um, in the face of poor availability and crazy pricing, this is a really well-made, uh, really high-performance product. So I am impressed with what I've seen in that sense. I just don't want to go hyping this up to you guys 
um, too much given the price and the fact that you can't really buy it. But hopefully in the near future, pricing and availability improves. And I'm certainly not going to guarantee that that will be the case. But my hope is in a few months from now, um, yeah, those things will have improved and it'll make more sense to buy a premium graphics card with a $2,000 US MSRP for the base models. Anyway, for now, I can't recommend you buy one. Uh, not too much more I can say on this. It is what it is. It's out of my hands. So yeah, that's the review of the Supreme Liquid. Uh, if you liked it, I guess give it a thumbs up. Subscribe for more RTX 5090 Unobtainium content because we will have more reviews coming up. I know it seems a bit pointless given the availability and pricing issues, but people do want to know the various different 5090 models, how they compare and the quality and whatnot. And again, the hope is in the not too distant future, it may make sense or hopefully it will make sense to buy one of these. But yeah, I'm sort of rambling, but I know how, uh, how these things go. So yeah, um, if you'd like more Harbour Unbox goodness, we have the join button, Patreon. You can sign up to either one of those. You'll get access to our exclusive Discord server where you can type in there and talk about how ridiculous pricing and availability is. We like to do that on a daily basis, multiple times per day. And we also have a live stream, behind the scenes content and Q&A stuff. So yeah, check that out if you're interested, but if not, that's perfectly fine. And I would like to thank you for watching this video. I'm your host, Steve. See you next time.